Over 2,000 people are reported missing every day. Some go missing under strange circumstances, while others vanish without a trace. This show discusses cases of people who mysteriously disappear and have not been found to this day. This is Disappeared, the podcast series. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Disappeared, the podcast series. I am your host, Benjamin. During the last episode, I talked about the idea of incorporating some other types of disappearances into the show, and I found a couple of topics that are both very interesting and are perfect for changing up the show a little. The first item I will be talking about is the Isabella Stewart Gardner heist of 1990, where a number of priceless paintings were stolen from the museum in Boston, Massachusetts. And the other subject I will cover is the Lost Treasure of Lima, which disappeared around 1820 and is believed to be buried somewhere on Cocos Island, which is located off the eastern coast of Costa Rica. But before I begin, I just want to say that I have the windows open in my house, so there might be occasional background noise. I hope it stays quiet out there, but planes occasionally do fly by, and a car might pass by also. Our high today is 78 degrees, so the day is just way too nice to keep the windows closed. So anyway, let me get right into it, and I'll start off with the museum theft. As I researched this heist, I swear my jaw kept dropping over and over again. This heist occurred during the night of March 18th of 1990 and involved the theft of 13 paintings by Degas, Varmir, Manet, and Rembrandt. I apologize if I butchered any of these artists' names. Although I'm actually a fairly decent artist, I am admittedly bad at artist names. Anyway, these 13 works of art are believed to be valued at, get this, north of half a billion dollars. That's billion with a B. This massive theft remains the biggest theft of private property ever. I sure hope they carried insurance. I can only imagine what an insurance premium for these works of art must have cost. A number of these works of art are considered priceless, so I have no idea how they would even go about insuring these. Can you only insure items with a documented value? I mean, not only how would you replace any of these artworks, but... How could you put a price on priceless? I will include some photo links to these artworks on my website, disappearedseries.weebly.com. Take a look at one of the Rembrandt paintings that was stolen that night. You may have heard of this one. I remember seeing this painting in a textbook a long time ago. The name of this painting is The Storm on the Sea of Galilee. It is an absolutely breathtaking work of art. I can appreciate artwork because I know how long it can take to produce artwork. This painting depicts the miracle of Jesus calming the storm, which is thrashing the waters of the Sea of Galilee. In the painting, Jesus can be seen as one of the 14 passengers to the far right of the painting. Everyone else in the painting looks just mortified, having come to the terms of their certain death, while Jesus is just chillaxing and with no expression on his face. He's simply looking forward and using his heavenly force to calm the storm. As amazing as this painting is, it is the only work of art done by Rembrandt where he painted a seascape. This past Christmas, I drew a picture for my wife, which was a picture of two wine bottles, two wine glasses, some grapes, and a cut of cheese. I only used pencils and a couple of colored pencils. The drawing took me nearly 30 hours to complete and I finished the drawing only because Christmas was just coming too quickly. I believe that a work of art can never truly be finished. There's always something to perfect in a drawing or painting. Maybe I'll throw that drawing up on the website too, although if you compare my drawing to the storm on the Sea of Galilee, it would be like comparing a candle to the freaking sun. But all jokes aside, whoever gets to gaze at this painting when they get up every morning, well... I can understand how it's kept a secret to this day. These two little vessels in the painting are crashing over a wave on the edge of a storm at sea. Sunlight is peeking through the clouds and casting sunlight on half the crew and passengers. The right of the painting fades into the darkness of the storm. It 
blows my mind that someone can take oil paint back in the 1600s and create such a stellar work of art. I admittedly suck at oil painting, mainly because I never gave them more than a couple chances. So it floors me when I see what people throughout history have been able to create with oil on canvas. All right, I'll quit rambling. Let me get back to the point here. Getting back to March 18th of 1990, two men walked into the building of the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum and were disguised as police officers. A security guard innocently believed these men to be legitimate officers and let them inside the building. Perhaps they said they were investigating a silent alarm or something. These two, quote, officers overtook the security guards, probably by gunpoint, and duct taped them to chairs and left them in the basement of the museum. During the 81 minutes that followed, 13 paintings were stolen from the building. To this day, all 13 frames hang empty in the rooms of this museum, something that the person in charge of the museum must see every day, and I can only imagine that deep, dark feeling of emptiness, especially being an art museum curator. But not to worry, Mr. or Mrs. Art Curator, these paintings won't be gone forever. They are simply too famous and valuable to stay hidden forever. Now, they might stay hidden for the next hundred years, but one day the world will get to admire them again. The FBI has headed up the investigation from the beginning, and the FBI are the best of the best when it comes to investigating. So there is no doubt in my mind that these paintings will be found sooner rather than later. In 2013, the FBI announced that they now know the identity of the individuals responsible but if not made their names public, and there are no subjects in custody. In a public statement, the FBI said the investigation is into its, quote, final chapter, despite the statement being made nearly four years ago now. Some speculated that this museum was targeted because of its relaxed security measures, but that isn't necessarily the case. Nearly every other museum in Massachusetts had been hit prior to 1990 and it was simply a matter of time before the Gardner Museum was chosen. In August of 2015, the FBI released video surveillance the day before the heist, showing a person of interest in connection with the heist. The video shows a vehicle pulling up to the museum rear entrance. This video matches the description given of a vehicle that pulled up to the museum moments before the heist occurred. The video is really hard to watch because everything a video can have wrong with it, this video does. The footage is grainy. It's very glitchy with only two to three frames per second. The video flickers and it's black and white, of course. The FBI released it hoping someone could identify this individual in the video who drives up to the museum, who is allowed inside against museum policy, and leaves after five minutes or so. I'll put a link to the YouTube video in the episode description on the Disappeared website. It takes a few minutes to get a handle on what the video is doing. I thought at first it was a video loop, but it is a full video. Just pay attention to the time as you watch the video. So anyway, on one hand, the FBI states they are in the quote, final chapter of solving this case, and on the other hand, two years after the statement they released this video, and on the other hand, two years after that statement, they release this video, hoping someone out there can positively ID this person seen in the footage. You would think that 25 years ago they would have tried to get the public to identify this person. Who is going to recognize a person from 25 years ago in this type of footage? I really doubt this video will get any definitive leads, but I hope I'm incorrect. If you are somehow, by some miracle, able to identify this person in the footage, contact the FBI at 617-742-5533. There is currently a $5 million reward for information leading to the recovery of the artworks, and the FBI has promised immunity from prosecution by the U.S. Attorney's Office. Rembrandt, being such a well-known artist throughout the world, has been the subject of over 70 thefts over the 20th century alone. The Rembrandt von Rinn has been stolen four times since 1966. But interestingly, the Rembrandt Sea of Galilee painting that so many of us know wasn't the highest valued painting stolen that night. It was actually the painting The Concert by Vermeer. Now it's time for me to discuss what I think happened. 
If you believe these paintings are collecting dust in an attic in middle America somewhere, I think you'd be very mistaken. I have serious doubts that most, if not all, of these paintings are anywhere inside the U.S. Rather, I believe they are secretly in the hands of very wealthy individuals who may or may not be involved in crime. If you're a billionaire, you have more money than you know what to do with. You start coveting items you simply can never own. What a trophy it would be to have an original priceless Rembrandt hanging in your secret study behind the bookcase in your mansion's library. You don't have to admire this work of art through a textbook or an imitation painting. You can feel the same texture Rembrandt once felt with your own fingertips any time you want. You don't have to travel thousands of miles to admire his work. All you have to do is walk down your hallway. And since this artwork has a priceless price tag, and those who lifted the painting probably weren't mega millionaires, you probably could purchase the painting for a discount price, especially since the painting is being hunted down by the FBI. For all we know, someone bought the Rembrandt Seascape for a mere $10 million. My opinion is that someone with a swimming pool-sized vault of cash obtained this artwork and is now hung in a luxurious room, which goes without saying is off-limits. It could be in Mexico, or it could be in Malaysia. I don't know. But what I'd bet money on is the fact that these paintings are nowhere near this museum. They've been gone 26 years now. These paintings could have exchanged the hands of multiple shady stewards over the years. The FBI does not list on their website who specifically is heading up the case today, after the previous agent in charge has since retired. But if you do have any information with regard to the whereabouts of any of these original works of art, you can call 1-800-CALL-FBI. Now I know that's about as generic as you can get, but that's the number they left on their webpage. It kind of reminds me of the 1-800-C-A-L-L-A-T-T days. Anyway, I sincerely hope these precious works of art can be recovered and restored back to their original quality. They are missed by many and will hopefully be hung in the rooms of their rightful home one day. All right, so now it's time to move on to the lost treasure of Lima. There is something important to discuss before you start Googling the treasure of Lima. There are articles published online claiming that park rangers on Cocos Island, the presumed resting place of the Lima treasure, were patrolling the island following a storm and discovered an old exposed wooden box. They unearthed it along with five other boxes and discovered a treasure valued at $200 million. This article is, in fact, a hoax. One way to tell is by visiting the Cocos Island Wikipedia page. I understand Wikipedia isn't 100% reliable, but it would surely mention such a massive discovery on its page. But there is no mention anywhere. Cocos Island is undeniably beautiful and would be an outdoor person's dream come true to explore this island. Cocos Island was never joined with the mainland, so much of the flora and fauna on the island exist on the island exclusively. The terrain is mountainous and is very difficult to navigate. Tropical rainforests fill the whole terrain. The island receives, get this, a whopping 276 inches of rain. Holy shit, that's a lot of rain. It gets all this rain mainly due to its location along the intertropical convergence zone, which creates a constant clouding and precipitation effect over the island. The average temperature throughout the year is 79.9 degrees Fahrenheit. The two highest peaks measure 2,788 feet and 1,574 feet above sea level. The island is five miles long, is dominated by coconut and other tropical trees, and due to the amount of rainfall the island receives, a number of waterfalls exist around the island. It quite simply sounds like a heaven on earth, and I haven't gotten to the good stuff yet. It has been estimated that up to a billion dollars or more worth of buried treasure has been placed on Cocos Island over the centuries. Two famous plunders are the lost treasure of Lima and the Benito Bonito treasure. The Benito Bonito treasure was reportedly buried on the island during the early 1800s and is estimated to be worth $300 million, if the treasure still exists today. And I will get into a possible discovery in a little bit. 
These treasures that were buried are originally of Spanish origin, and there's a pretty good chance that if you uncover these riches, you may be handing it all over to Spain. Now I have to share a story with you of a shipwreck that was discovered and a whopping 17 tons worth of treasure was recovered from a ship believed to be the Nuestra Senora de la Mercedes, a galleon ship that was founded in 1804 by British warships while en route from South America. This ship was carrying a load of silver and other artifacts worth an estimated $500 million in today's money. During this bloody battle at sea with the British, the Mercedes lost 250 crewmen and 51 survivors were recovered from the sea. The ship sank to the bottom of the ocean off the coast of Portugal, and there it remained undisturbed for over 200 years until it was rediscovered by the Odyssey Marine Exploration, codenamed Black Swan. The Odyssey vessel is based in the Tampa Bay area, which is in my general neck of the woods. I thought that was cool. The Odyssey recovered 594,000 gold and silver coins in total. Something I felt was totally unfair is that Peru attempted to claim the treasure, citing the fact that Spain plundered the stash from Peru in the first place. However, a court proceeding determined that because Peru was a Spanish colony at the time the treasure was taken, Peru didn't have a leg to stand on. See, this is simply unfair in my eyes. Let's take the country of Poland, for example. We have no idea how many millions or even billions of dollars in valuables was stolen from the country of Poland, as well as other countries by Nazi Germany. These valuables were taken from these countries by Germany while they were under German occupation. So comparing this to the Spain-Peru situation, Germany is entitled to keep any treasures they collected from countries they occupied, right? But of course nobody can justify that. Nor can we justify Spain as being the country entitled to the treasure found by the Odyssey. Spain stormed the territory of what Peru is today, and they forced the region into occupation, just like Nazi Germany forced countries into occupation. Spain shouldn't have the right to these artifacts any more than the American salvage company had the right. With all the blood Spain had spilled all over the Western Hemisphere back in the day, they should have no right to keep any historical artifacts they took from the West. I know that occupying a country is to force yourself into that country, usually by military force, and maintain your presence there. Whereas a colony is generally the next stage, where the occupying force is conducting trade, and the occupied force are economically benefiting from the presence of this occupying force. At least this is how I understood the difference. Spain says they colonized Peru, but did they really give the people of Peru a system of fair trade? After reading my history books in school, my takeaway was that Spain probably wasn't so fair to the Peruvians. I don't know if the salvage company who brought up the treasure brought up this notion or not, but I sure would have. I believe they have a moral obligation, if not a legal one, to return this treasure to its rightful owners, the country of Peru. The Odyssey Marine Expedition spent $2.6 million salvaging, transporting, storing, and conserving the treasure. So you'd think Spain would be nice enough to compensate them for their efforts, especially being that Spain wouldn't have a single one of these coins today if it weren't for the Odyssey Expedition. But nope. Spain is deciding to be stingy, stating that the Odyssey Company should have not tried to recover the ship's contents in the first place. Well, that's an awfully crappy thing to do. Spain is receiving $500 million worth of treasure that really belongs to Peru in the first place, and they won't even allow the Odyssey expedition to break even. Wow. Just wow. Odyssey argued in court that the ship they recovered these contents from wasn't definitively proven to be the Mercedes, and therefore cannot be claimed by Spain. But on the other hand, international treaties generally state that ships sunken in battle are protected from treasure hunters. This is the very definition of a bureaucratic nightmare. At an undisclosed time, MacDill Air Force Base in Tampa flew the treasure back to Spain. So to bring this rant back around full circle, I would virtually guarantee that whoever finds buried treasure on Cocos Island would be handing it over to Spain because they have a knack for doing just that. I would feel compelled to secretly keep it all for myself, but there is a problem there. 
When you visit Cocos Island, you must be escorted by park rangers at all times and therefore wouldn't have an opportunity to hide literally a ton of valuables from them. I suppose you could split the booty with them, but you would never know how they react to that offer. Now, one could argue that the treasure was stolen by the British trader Captain William Thompson back in 1820 and buried it on the island. But where did Captain William Thompson obtain the Lima treasure? You guessed it, Spain. There's actually an inventory document that lists the contents of the treasure. In this document includes 113 gold religious statues, a life-size Virgin Mary, 200 chests of jewels, 273 swords with jeweled hilts, 1,000 diamonds, solid gold crowns, 150 chalices, and a hundred of gold and silver bars. In the year 2012, a British exploration effort headed by Sean Whitehead was granted by authorities after 18 months of negotiations to scour Cocos Island in search of a treasure. But it is with the understanding that the expedition is to be mainly of a scientific nature. A number of scientific studies and efforts will be pursued in addition to the exploration for any treasure. If a treasure trove is found, they are to stop excavation immediately and notify authorities. They are also not allowed to keep what they find. It all goes to the Costa Rican government and they can deal with Spain's greedy little fingers. Sean Whitehead said that the island has not been explored for treasure in over 30 years. Today, we have a much different form of technology to work with. So Sean went on to say that caves in the past may have been covered by landslides, which occurs often on the island. To combat this challenge, they plan to use a special drill to bore a one inch wide hole into the rock and use an optical camera to have a peek inside. But I'm not sure if they're looking for the treasure through the hole or just a cave. Being that treasure is usually buried, I assume they're just looking for caves buried by these landslides. I have tried to find an update on this expedition but was unsuccessful. So I assume they still have yet to conduct this effort to find the Lima treasure. If any of you out there are bored and want a homework assignment, try searching for Sean Whitehead, Lima treasure, and Cocos Island, and just see what you come up with. Try to get an update on the expedition he's trying to lead, if he hasn't done so yet. I assume it hasn't happened yet because I found numerous articles dated August 2012 covering the announcement to explore the island but nothing other than that announcement. Today, Cocos Island is obviously restricted from public access. The island has many unique species of land and marine life and has been designated as a World Heritage Site. You need a special permit issued by the Costa Rican government to access the island and must be escorted by park rangers at all times. But of course, this hasn't stopped treasure hunters posed as scientists from visiting the island in an attempt to locate the buried loot Sean's group is self-funded. Now, for a little backstory on this treasure. The Lima treasure, said to be worth about $250 million today, was collected in Lima, which is now Peru. At the time the treasure left Lima, the area was orchestrating a revolt against the Spanish and the Spanish Viceroy of Lima, whose name was Jose de la Serna. Jose handed the riches off to Captain Thompson and instructed him to transport the loot to Mexico, which was also a Spanish colony at the time. Captain Thompson then loaded up the cargo onto his vessel, the Mary Deer. After leaving the port of Calo, located near Lima, Thompson, along with his crew, killed the Viceroy's six men and set sail for the Cocos Island. Once they arrived on the island, they searched for the perfect burial spot and stashed the treasure away. They set sail once again for the open ocean and were later apprehended by a Spanish warship. Everyone on the ship was executed for piracy except two crewmates who assured the Spanish that if they were allowed to keep their own lives, they would reveal the location of the buried treasure. Once the Spanish landed on Cocos Island, the two crewmates ran for their lives and disappeared into the jungle. They were not recaptured by the Spanish, and it is suspected they remained on the island for a whole year before being picked up by a passing ship. By the way, they are not suspected of taking the loot with them.
but I would not rule that out as being possible. In addition to the Lima treasure and the Benito Bonito treasure, yet another treasure is rumored to be buried on Cocos Island, which is a stash of 350 tons of gold, raided by a variety of Spanish ships by the British sailor Captain Bennett Graham. If this is true, and literally 350 tons of gold is buried out there, this would equate to 700,000 pounds of gold, which is a current value of $13.3 billion. Maybe that's what happened to El Dorado. The Spanish found it, confiscated 350 tons of gold from the city, and Captain Graham stole it all for himself. But this buried treasure sounds a little far-fetched. So let's say that one man could carry 75 pounds of gold from a ship to a dinghy across a beach and to a burial location, say, a quarter mile from shore. And it takes the average man 45 minutes to make a single trip, including rowing the boat to and from the ship. 700,000 pounds of gold would require 9,333 individual trips. The ship had maybe five little boats to transport the men from the ship to the beach. I think these little boats are called dinghies, but I'm not sure, so I'll just go with the term boat. So each man weighed, say, 150 pounds. They didn't eat very much out at sea, so most sailors back then were probably rather skinny. Now, you take 150 pounds plus 75 pounds of gold, which equals 225 pounds per man. I'll say that six men could fit onto each boat without it sinking or being flipped over by a wave. So five boats, six men per boat, giving each boat a load weight of 1,350 pounds. Five boats, six men per boat, so 30 men could make a single trip with these boats. 30 men, 75 pounds of gold each, equals 2,250 pounds of gold per trip. All five boats combined would need to take a total of 312 trips to get all the gold onto the island. 45 minutes per trip, 312 trips. This effort would take about 234 hours. The men work for 24 hours a day in shifts, moving the gold. But let's say that there is a crew of 200 men on board, and they take these trips to the island in groups in order to complete this task around the clock. This way the men can take breaks without wasting time. This effort would take 9 days and 18 hours to complete. So it's not totally impossible, but what if their ship had only two little boats to move the gold onto the island? In this case, the effort would require 583 hours to get the job done, which would be 24 days and 7 hours. If the Spanish believed that Captain Graham was headed in the direction of Cocos Island, 24 days would be plenty of time for them to catch up to Captain Graham. But who knows how accurate my numbers are. I was just making educated guesses on those numbers, which is why I threw in the two rowboats scenario. After all, I have virtually no knowledge of historical marine navigation or ships or anything. I don't even know if the word dinghy describes the rowboats I'm referring to. But I do know that a warship back then wasn't generally beached because it would be a real pain in the ass to get that back out to sea. Well, we still do that today. That's why you don't see big yachts up on the shore. They have those little boats to take them to the shore while the vessel remains anchored away from the beach. There was another pirate said to have buried treasure on Cocos Island, whom I had mentioned before. But I'm not going to get into this story since I spent so much time on the last one, but I'm referring to the Benito Bonito treasure. But as for the Lima treasure, that's all I have. So with that being said, that's all I have on the treasures of Cocos Island and the Lima treasure itself. So what do I think of this fascinating story? Well, I believe there is treasure on the island today. I mean, how bad would this story be with me saying that there's no treasure left on the island? Of course there's treasure there. Wink, wink. No, but seriously, while I believe treasure is likely still on the island, I'm betting that at least one buried treasure was previously recovered. During my research into this topic, I stumbled across an article talking about a person or persons landing on the island 
and doing some exploration back during the late 1800s, early 1900s. They found a cave somewhere on the island, and down inside the cave, they noticed a bronze chain barely poking out of the sand. They pulled on the chain and ended up unearthing a treasure chest. They took the contents with them off the island and disappeared into history. This is just a legend, if you'd even call it that. More like a rumor, really. But given the proximity of the island to South America, Central America, and Mexico, there could be a number of buried treasures on this island. Cocos Island is absolutely perfect for burying treasure. Again, it's in close proximity to Latin America, where Spain had presence throughout. Spain is cleaning out Latin America of its treasures and hauling it overseas constantly. So there are probably a number of times where a Spanish ship was stolen from. I bet Spain had quite the reputation of high rolling around the oceans. I should research that. How many times valuables were stolen from Spanish ships back in the day? But not only is Cocos Island in an ideal location, but the island is five miles long and has numerous caves throughout the beach areas and the interior. The island also receives a ton of rainfall a year, so fresh water is always going to be there. Water is something I imagine to be something ships would have to stock up on, and what better place to find water than Cocos Island, where the water is extremely clean due to the lack of human presence and the fact that it rains and the water flows a very short distance to the ocean. It's a good island to flee into, as we learned from the two captured pirates who fled into the forest. The terrain is pretty hostile, which would make a manhunt quite difficult. So, my conclusion is that some treasure has surely been located between back then and today. The two guys who escaped from the Spaniards may have known of the treasure's location and returned at a later time. Or they could have told someone about its location. Maybe they drew a map and gave it to their kids. I don't know. But I assume the stories of buried treasure on the island has been passed down since the treasure was lost on the island. That would give treasure hunters 200 plus years to find the buried loot. Anyway, that's all I have for this show. I hope you enjoyed, and don't forget to visit my website at disappearedseries.weebly.com for the latest show information and free downloads of all my episodes. Contact me through my website or send me an email to disappearedseries at gmail.com. Thank you very much for listening. Be on the lookout for my next show, and in the meantime, Stay safe out there.